Good afternoon, I'm Jane Wales, and what we're doing, first we want to welcome back our web audience uh, to this conversation we're going to have with uh, Dina Habib Powell. Um, let me just sort of say that we've, we've talked about what are the building blocks of a stable society, and, and one of those is obviously an inclusive economy. Um, and Dina has spent uh, her recent career uh, focusing on the importance of small and growing businesses throughout the developing world and the role that knowledge plays. So what are the knowledge needs of the people who are going to start those businesses, lead those businesses, um, with a particular attention on the role that women can play. Um, Dina is now president of the Goldman Sachs Foundation. Uh, she also leads Goldman Sachs Gives. Uh, and she's head of corporate engagement at well, Goldman Sachs as well. I should note that Dina also has a policy background. She was deputy undersecretary of state, uh, and before that, an assistant secretary of state. And her focus was on public diplomacy and educational and, and cultural affairs when she was there. Um, Dina is also a member of the Aspen Philanthropy Group, so I get to see her in the summer as well. Now, in this audience, what Goldman is best known for, the Goldman Sachs Foundation, is the 10,000 Women's Program, and probably the 10,000 Business Program as well, uh, which is a domestic program. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that. But I wanted to start with the fact that Dina was born uh, in Egypt and came here as a small girl. And we opened our session yesterday talking a bit about what happened in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere. And I want to know, I think you still have some family there. And I want to know whether you and they were as taken by surprise as we were. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Jane. And congratulations on 10 years. And it's just such an extraordinary achievement. <laughs> When, when Jane Wales calls you and tells you to be in San Francisco or Aspen or DC, you, taking no for an answer mm -hmm. doesn't work, but everyone is so delighted to participate and it's having such a huge impact. Um, you know, um, I told this story and Jane asked me to share it with you all. Um, as, as Jane said, I was born in Egypt and my, actually my, my first seminal memory was more than 30 years ago. Um, attending the graduation of my mother at the American University in Cairo. Uh, when my mom uh, tells the story, she always adds the embarrassing um, addition, like moms do, that she was the only woman that day in a cap and gown whose toddler insisted on going on stage with her. <laughs> um, and she remembers it obviously vividly for many reasons, um, particularly though after the ceremony, her favorite professor approached um, my mom and, and my dad and said, you know, Unsi and Huda, you are the future of Egypt. And I think at that moment they felt so hopeful about what would come. But sadly, just a few short years later, they realized having two little girls uh, who they wanted to frankly have the chance to reach their full potential that would be, what would be better is not staying in their homeland but coming to the United States. And I said to Jane, it's as if 30 years stood still until the aspirations of millions of young parents across Egypt literally spilled into Tahrir Square on January 25th. And people uh, in the square weren't focused on religious issues or uh, political issues, frankly. They were very, very focused on job creation and growth and opportunity for their kids. And I think that's where you know um, we should be focused. I think we should be extremely focused right now in thinking about uh, what we can all do to invest in the Egyptian economy and make sure that the population, uh, the more than 80 million people that live there, but 80% of that 80 million uh, is under the age of 29 or younger. So there's a huge sort of youth opportunity, youth movement that we, we could work in a, both from the United States perspective and the international community to equip that next generation with the skills and training and education they need to get a job. I think that's the most significant thing that can be done. And what's striking, and we're going to focus most of our attention this lunchtime uh, on women, but um, say a word about the opportunities for a college-educated young man uh, in, in Egypt today. Well, I, th I mean, I, I think that's, again, why the you know um, face of the revolution, if you will, was not a military leader or a religious figure. It was a young Google exec. Mm -hmm. Um, and many of his colleagues uh, there, you know, joining him, wanting, you know, the Egyptian people to have the opportunity, just a fair playing field. Um, and it's why entrepreneurship, uh, frankly, I think uh, right now there's enormous opportunity for a huge focus on entrepreneurship in Egypt. You know, I, I think it's going to be very challenging days ahead, and I think that it's 
um, you know, I, I hope people have kind of patience mm -hmm. to support mm -hmm. what, what goes on because while there's a, a big fear of extremist elements emerging, I think we also have a unique opportunity to make sure that that saying, as Egypt goes, so goes the Middle East, is actually a positive. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the 10,000 women's program is among, or I think it's in about 22 countries, but one of them is Egypt. Mm -hmm. Can you just say a word about what kinds of outcomes you're seeing there? Sure, sure. Well, the 10,000 women program is a five-year commitment by uh, Goldman Sachs to educate that number of women around the world with business and management education, uh, links to capital, and mentoring and networking by the people of the firm. Um, we are in 24 countries, uh, and it's really been remarkable to see by the end of this year, uh, 5,000 of the 10,000 will have been reached. And uh, I think Mark Kramer is here somewhere. Um, you know, we did a lot of research and reading his work about the critical need, obviously, of measurement and evaluation, but of being very thoughtful about the online platforms and how we do that. And it's been really terrific to see that um, one of the positives of this residing at Goldman Sachs is that they constantly measure us. And in terms of job creation and growth, uh, we've seen great results. Seventy percent of the women have increased their revenues. Fifty percent are creating new jobs. But of course, there's always a, a, a double return, if you will. And we were looking for a particularly smart investment. Those of you here know, I'm sure, that educated women represent healthier and, and more prosperous societies, and we're just increasingly seeing this fact. I see Ruth Levine uh, sitting there from AID. I mean, AID has really thought smartly about how to increase the uh, investment in women's programming around the world, again, because it's a smart investment. And um, we're now uh, seeing in particular countries the difference it's having. Egypt is one of them. 200 uh, women have participated in the program. Uh, taught in Arabic at the American University in Cairo because we wanted to get representation from the 29 governance. Women who just have such great ideas, passion, wonderful business models, but really didn't know Accounting 101, marketing, growth business planning. How do you access capital? And you see, because I've had the privilege of sitting through classes in Cairo and, and uh, Brazil and all over, you see the light bulb going off. You know, you see it going off like, oh, I should... I should really benchmark against my competition and reduce my price in this category or create this product or I understand now I've got to have a different accounting system. So it's, it's been really interesting to see that I know you're very focused on turning point countries and I should say that just March 8th um, our CEO Lloyd Blankfein actually had the privilege of joining Secretary Clinton and Mrs. Obama to announce an expansion of the program. Uh, because we had been working so closely with them in certain countries, they began to ask, well, what about Pakistan? Is there a 10,000 women program in Pakistan where economic empowerment of women is so critical? Now, that's, that's where public-private partnerships really come in handy because that is a country where you really should be working with you know, um, a good partner, like the State Department, if you're really going to do it the right way. So we work with Ambassador Milan Verveer, and uh, the embassy actually selects the entrepreneurs, and uh, we have a little bit of a, a variation on the model there because of the challenges. But it's, it's really interesting to see. Yeah. And the shoe used to be on the other foot. I mean, you, you <laughs> used to be the person in, at the State Department who That's was right. forging these kinds of partnerships. Did, were there specific things you learned from that experience that you've carried over into the uh, Goldman Sachs context? You know what? I, I, indeed, I, I think that um, when we think about the global challenges that so many of you in this room are, are facing and frankly doing such a good job to impact, and the 10 years of the Philanthropy Forum, um, I really believe that if you're really going to effectively succeed and have results, you've got to have all three legs of the stool, the public, the private, and the nonprofit sector. I mean, in this day and age, you really have to forge those kinds of partnerships. And I'll, I'll give you one example that we launched at, at the firm. Um, uh, we had been approached by President Johnson Sirleaf about a program in Liberia, and of course, again, very challenging. But what had happened was uh, OPIC had announced a very significant lending facility in Monrovia, $30 million that would be um, you know, earmarked, if you will, for women-owned businesses. There's just one problem at that time when it was announced. In Monrovia, uh, most of the women were, had not been educated, sadly, for so many decades. And they, there weren't enough, there wasn't any kind of training program. So OPIC actually entered into a partnership with us where they guaranteed loans to the women who 
would be credit worthy after they graduated from 10,000 women. So it sort of inspired us and gave us a reason to invest. And we have a program there at the University of Cuttington, which it's extraordinary. We, we've had um, just happened to have a few women that had been invited to a White House event here for International Women's Week. One of them, Christine Tour, um, who's just extraordinary. She, she came back after the Civil War had ended. Uh, she started a hair salon, but then realized she needed to do more hence the double investment, and uh, built a girls' school teaching women uh, how to weave. And she insisted on taking, uh, weave hair and do style hair. Mm -hmm. She insisted on taking the most vulnerable women mm -hmm. in the community. And it's just been amazing. She's trained more than 50 women. She's employed um, 25 full-time people. Just, just you see, you, women, uh, actually, in every country we work in, whenever you hear these stories, some that are so difficult, particularly in Afghanistan, for example, but when they want to tell you their story or, they, or you visit their business, they're so hopeful. I'll, they say, you know what, don't, don't take any pity on me. Just give me the tools I need and I'll do the rest. So could, would you mind if I just show a really quick clip sure. of, of Oyo from, uh, Ayo, am I I am from Nigeria? <laughs> so, just get a, so the rest of us have a picture of this. I run a catering outfit known as No Leftovers in Nigeria. Apart from the practical skills I have with cooking, I needed business skills. With the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Initiative, I was able to learn how to delegate. I was able to transition from my kitchen and my home to having my own accommodation. I've also learned that there's a need to network. I speak with some business language. I never knew what benchmarking was all about. <laughs> I never knew what strategy was all about. You know, but now, hey, check me out. Yeah. When a woman is empowered, the truth is she doesn't think of herself first. She thinks of the person next door. She thinks of her family. She puts everybody before herself. And you can imagine if everybody has that mindset, you can just imagine what the world would be like. I had to show that because she's so. I, I love the. I love the hey, check me out part of that. So, I mean, it strikes me, Dina, that you've been working with and, and meeting women from Rwanda, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Brazil, all around the world. What do they? They all come from very different contexts. What do they have in common? One very specific desire a better future for their children, mm -hmm. a, a better future for the next generation. You know, it's, it's just, a, it's remarkable. Um, I'll tell you the story to best um, illustrate that. So we have a program in Kabul, Afghanistan, at the American University in Afghanistan in a partnership with Angel Cabrera Thunderbird School of Management. And um, we started three, more, yeah, more than three years ago, and, and the uh, women there, of course, very different kinds of challenges, but there's a woman uh, that's participated in this program called Rangina Hamidi. She owns a company called Kandahar Treasures, where she goes to the most conservative provinces throughout the country, and Taliban controlled, still, many of them, and takes handicraft that the women make, sells it, and returns the proceeds to the women in their homes. And she told us a story once about a woman who lived in Bamyan, a very conservative province, and how when she'd approached the door to give her her proceeds those months, the woman grabbed Rangina's hand and she said, I've got to tell you a story. My husband has never respected me. My husband has never asked my opinion on any matter. But ever since I started making just a little bit of income, he asks me questions now. And recently, he asked me, 
whether or not I, we should send our three girls to school. And he prefaced it by saying, I don't believe in girls' education. I don't know why they have these girls' schools going up around us. And this woman was so smart, instead of begging him to let them go to school, she said, you know, these three girls will be a burden on you all our lives. You will have to work so hard to provide a dowry for each of them. But if they go to school, like me, they will make money and they will support you in your old age. <laughs> and there was this long pregnant pause and the man looked at her and said, you are right, we will force them to go to school. <laughs> and Rangina had tears in her eyes when she was telling the story. She said, those three little girls are in school now. And this woman, who is illiterate, who will never leave her home, used her moment of power so wisely, and she was able to have that moment of power when she was economically independent. So, you know, it's, she, that's what she wanted to do. That's what she wanted more than anything was to give those three girls a chance, and their sons and daughters, and her, the future generation of her family, a different life. And that is what you see that's just consistent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, she's role model for, for those <laughs> girls, too. She is. She is. Now, you're, this is a, a seven-week program, is that right? It or depends. It's a curriculum? We've been very careful to respect the cultural and local needs. You know, 100% of this investment is invested in each country because we wanted to make sure it was sustainable. So it's at local universities and business schools with the help of local NGOs. We're very focused on cultural differences with the selection. I don't know if Phil Drayton's still here, but we worked with Ashoka to really think smartly about the selection of the entrepreneurs. Um, we insist on underserved women. You know, that's where we saw the opportunity is women who didn't currently have access to any kind of management education. And there's been a very interesting thing that's happened, which is we're working at very high quality schools, Tsinghua University in Beijing, uh, the School of Finance in Kigali, Rwanda. And they're admitting to us now that this is having such a huge impact on them because they had previously educated the elites of their countries. And they're having a very different population through this program. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned that you work with partners on the ground, educational partners. So I should do a shoot, shout out to um, to Ruben Ibrahim of the Indian School of Business, because that's one of I your just partners. I emailed him. Is he here? Yeah. Yes, one of our so, yeah. strong partners in um, Hyderabad. Very good example of the fact that this is a, you know, Harvard. Uh, I get in trouble when I say that because I know there are many good schools in India, but it's an outstanding. We say it's the Stanford of India. It's you Stanford, said the Harvard. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to the University of Texas, so I'm certainly not a lead about my schools. But the, um, the Indian School of Business has been one of the most outstanding partners. Um, they, there, the program is uh, over a few months. And they, again, reach women throughout India, actually. Um, and we have, diff we have programs uh, in Bangalore and Mumbai as well, and affiliated with uh, ISB. And it's, it's just been remarkable to see. And in India, of course, you've got an economy that's growing. And women entrepreneurs being part of it is so critical because, again, they're you know, instantly returning and paying it forward in their communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the curriculum, I guess, adap is adapted from country to country. It's not identical. It is. is we've, right? we've had some, you know, really terrific core partners. ISB, Wharton, um, Babson has been integral in really helping us with what, what do you really need, pragmatic business education, to help a small business owner, not a startup, but a small business owner, someone that already has a few people, like Io. Io was in the very first cohort of 10,000 women. Uh, in Lagos, Nigeria. We were there when, when some of that footage was taken. Um, here was this woman who um, was a really, really good cook. She made the best moi moi, the specialty in uh, Nigeria. And her sister had been encouraging her to start something, you know, do some catering. But she just really wasn't very confident. That's why when I see that video, it's just extraordinary to me because when I met her, she was this shy, retiring woman who wasn't sure. She, of course, ended up being a star in the program realized that her pricing was off, realized that she should be working with government contracting, you know, all these things. We always made sure to have her husband with us at every step of the way. He was extremely proud of her. And uh, she just called us last week. She's created 25 new jobs, got a car instead of taking taxis to deliver everything in Lagos, Nigeria, and was just awarded a contract for the school lunch program in Lagos. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, extraordinary. And she's a different person. Yeah. So as you think about each, I mean, I'll sort of take you to the whole question of evaluation and how you, you all go about evaluating those programs. I mean, you're asking them to be strategic. <clears throat> and of course, you're, you're trying to see the impact. 
Um, and I wanted to have a sense from you, I, I know that uh, the overall program has been evaluated by Bridgespan, is that right? With really They've helped set up our metrics and validate it, yeah. Right, with a wonderful uh, effort. But when it comes to the each local program on the ground, how do you go about that, the, the evaluation of those? Well, we, again, realized the you know, measurement and evaluation was key. You know, when you work at a financial firm, uh, numbers are everything, and we wanted to make sure we were able to always show in very clear ways and track the progress and see which programs worked better and why, and, and really uh, we're working with Jane now on that uh, article, and, and really share this knowledge, you know, with, with um, colleagues. Um, and so we actually, as part of our grant in each country, have a measurement and evaluation liaison. <laughs> we have to find a, a better term probably, but someone who's a program, part of the program, but really serving function of working with the program team, but really also a dual report to us. Mm -hmm. And they track the job creation, they track the revenues. You know, the women are also taught why this is important because they have to provide all of this data and they, they you know, also have spot checks, if you will. And what's been interesting is that each country, we, we really talk to the graduates about the data and they tell us, well, you know what, I think if I'd had more accounting, this, it would have really been helpful to me because I could have had a, you know, uh, a better understanding here or there. So when they see that it's actually helping to change each program, they feel that it's really worth their time because we all know that the measurement and evaluation is a big ask of the participants. So that's been one thing. We've had such a great you know, participation rate of everybody you know, to, that's gone through it in terms of providing data. And then, of course, it's helped shape a lot. You know, we've asked ourselves, you know, why is this program working much better than this program? And we've been able to tweak things and really change it. Mm -hmm. And are you able to share that data I mean, once you're, once you're finished with a few rounds with the field more broadly, so it contributes to field-wide learning. We are. So we're part of ANDI, the Aspen Network of Entrepreneurs, and, and as part of that, we share with many of um, the organizations that are working on small and medium-sized enterprise growth. You know, it's a, it's a very you know, specific area, and we are all finding in this field that small and medium-sized entrepreneurs are the answer to the global recession. I mean, really, uh, you know, the more that we can grow these small and medium-sized enterprises, not only is job creation enhanced, um, but overall GDP growth. And so it's, we're, I think, all beginning to come around to what, what is the solution, what is the opportunity. And it's the knowledge, the networks and mentoring, the capital. And um, we've been sharing a lot of the data from our curriculum and other pieces. Yeah. I want to ask something about, about the way corporate philanthropy itself is changing. Um, you know, here's a case where it, in order to have real impact, you have to stay with it for the long term. And yes. you have to know from year to year what kind of resources are available to you. And many corporate uh, foundations are about you know, a different budget each year. And it's a lot harder uh, to, to take that approach and have it take a long view and sort of overcome. Actually, Judy Samuelson uh, from uh, Aspen Program on Business and Society always focuses on the whole question of short-termism. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, how do you overcome short-termism to mm -hmm. make this kind of thing work? Well, I, I think it takes leadership at the top. And you know, one of the reasons I was attracted to this position is that for many, many years, the firm has really been dedicated to investing smartly in you know, the communities in which uh, we have offices around the world. And you know, we, we very purposefully, the, the management committee, the board decided that we would hold ourselves accountable to a set amount of money and a set amount of women and you know certain kinds of results we wanted to see. So it's a hundred million dollar investment over five years to reach 10,000 women and to build the capacity in each of these institutions. I mean, that was a piece of it is that we really wanted to make sure we were building the entrepreneurial capacity of each of these educational institutions that could be sustained. So professor training, case studies, relevant local case studies. We always tell the story about how we found out that um, in one of the few MBA classes in uh, Cape Town, the case study for the entrepreneurs, the small and medium sized entrepreneurs, was the Compaq HP merger. <laughs> it just had absolutely no relevance to what they needed to know. And so we've actually now done uh, you know, 200 case studies, and many of them now are the 10,000 women participants, but also men. And what happened in your, uh, what a real entrepreneur in your country and what challenges they faced and, and how they dealt with them. So I think the holding ourselves accountable, but then you know, I think the foundation team then is able to say, okay, we know that these dollars are allocated and we've had to, of course, show our budget and our strategic plan, but I think that's what's really important is that if you are going to um, have a significant investment, 
really holding yourself to a certain goal with a certain budget. And then we know, we, of course, we're very happy that our CEO has now, of course, been saying that we'll be going beyond the five years, but you know, we had to prove it and the, the model first. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question, but I'm also, we're going to uh, open this for a couple of questions from the floor before we start, so start thinking of your questions. Um, but you know, in part, it's about the CEO, but what about the employees, mm -hmm. uh, both in your company, but in other companies, you, when you look around, to what degree is there employee demand for a social change agenda? Well. Um, yeah, this is also what I would answer if you said to me, what have you all not done right? What's, what's your challenge been? Um, it's that we knew people at the firm would want to be involved. And it's frankly why we picked a program like uh, around job creation and growth, because there are a few people at Goldman Sachs who can read a business plan and understand a loan application. This is something that uh, uh, the people that work at Goldman Sachs know something about. Um, I don't think we realized quite how many people would want to be involved. So we have hundreds of people on a waiting list to be mentors and business advisors to the 10,000 women and now 10,000 small businesses. Thank gosh, we have another <laughs> big program because uh, people are reviewing business plans, are helping um, you know, the participants think about their strategies. And that's been so important. I mean, frankly, when you, one of the reasons why we invested in this, you know, why, why is this uh, such a big priority for our leadership? It's because we differentiate ourselves by trying to retain and recruit, recruit and retain the very best people. And individuals now want to work at an institution where they have an ability to have a direct impact in this way. And I wanted to ask, I have to sneak in a policy question. I apologize for this. But um, I, I, I'm struck by the fact, we, we, you and I talked about this in Washington last week, that, that what happened in North Africa was a leaderless revolution. And that's been mentioned a couple of times yesterday. Um, but of course, governance isn't leaderless, right? Mm -hmm. So I want you to reflect a little bit on what could go wrong if you're not building a cadre of leaders, either through business experience or other experiences. Well, I mean, we see that everywhere in the world, sadly, particularly in the Middle East, that when civil society and political parties are suppressed for decades, leaders cannot you know, naturally go through a system. I think it is why uh, in some of the countries, not just in the Middle East, but in some of the turning point countries, business leaders are emerging because they have the respect of, of the citizens, they have some kind of management experience. I mean, if you look at most of the emerging economies, or maybe I'll just speak for you know, Middle Eastern countries, there are not that many private citizens that were really participating in government. You know, they, it was people that spent 30 or 40 years in government. You know, here in the United States, it's a, it's a uh, you know, messy process, but we certainly have people that come from all walks of life that lead our government, and that's very important for the process. So I think a very, a, a good policy these countries should employ is bringing people from civil society, from NGOs, from the private sector in. They'll have more credibility with the people too, I think. Absolutely.